Welcome to Goonies World. My name is Goonie, also known as Colin. And I'm joined by Meanie, also known as Ryan. <laughs> Hello. And Johnny Farrow, also known as Sean. Hello and happy Halloween. <laughs> and our special returning guest star, Looneycorn, also known as Lynn. Hello, hello, happy Halloween. <laughs> well, th- yes, this is our Halloween special, and like last year's Halloween special, we are playing Call of Cthulhu, uh, or at least my fast and loose approach to the sixth edition of the game. And we are rejoining our characters from that special, although you certainly don't need to have listened to that one to enjoy this one. But I'm sure we're in for a sinister time as we enter our imaginary world and hover over Arkham, Massachusetts. That storied town where so many strange things have happened. And our eye focuses in on the gothic structure of the Arkham Sanitarium. And in through a window where former investigative reporter Rachel Hemingway sits in a bright light Uh, of a light bulb that's hanging over a table in his unfurnished room and there's a man in a white coat across from her an older man with a goatee and a monocle and this is of course Dr. Harcourt and Rachel Hemingway is Goonie's character from last time and uh, this is where Rachel ended up at the end of our last game here in Arkham Sanatorium and we're just going to start with you Colin now, says Dr. Harper, Rachel, you've been here for quite some time now, and I think we've made a great deal of progress, don't you? Yes, I'm feeling much better now. Yeah. Are you feeling less anxious? Oh, yes, this is a very relaxing place. I've had a lot of time to think and collect myself, and uh, I'm, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling very clear-headed now. That's good. So, so you no longer persist in this delusion uh, of of uh, cosmic entities and strange supernatural occurrences there uh, at the home on that night. You now realize that the house was merely struck by lightning and damage occurred. Yes. Yes, and I think because I went in there looking for some sort of scoop, and the the lightning and everything just sort of went to my head, and I my imagination went wild and and then I started to believe my own uh, delusions that's all well that happens with creative people sometimes and I know you're a writer do you think you might get back to work oh yes I'm I've, I've regained my confidence and uh, I think uh, I'd like to prove myself once again uh, to the uh, journalistic community and and show them that I'm a fantastic writer and so um, I'm gonna hopefully look for the next scoop. Well, now, let's just remember, though, in the future to not let your imagination get the better of you. Now, in the meantime, I'm going to give you this. You will have a prescription for some six months or so, and he hands you a bottle. Now, this is a a rather heady mix of ethanol and opium. If you begin to feel anxious, make sure and take it. I certainly will. Now, you'll be happy to know that you, as you're well aware, your friend Margot Macy has been sponsoring your treatment here, and underwriting it, and uh, I have decided that you're cured, and that uh, she can come get you and uh, help you reestablish your life. And you'll be happy to know I've already taken the liberty of contacting her, and uh, uh, she and another old friend of yours, a Mr. Saul Moran, I believe it says here. Yes, uh, that's how you be- say it. Is, is, is that how you say it? Yes, yes that's my, correct. Th- oh, yes, good, good. Well, well, uh, they are here to uh, pick you up, and so we've made your regular clothing available to you. You can have a bit to freshen up so you don't have to appear in these things. And, of course, you're wearing just like the, you know, the, the simple sack-like gray-issued dress they give the female patients here. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, so I'll let you get about your business. And clean up, and then we'll escort you down to meet uh, Ms. Macy and uh, Mr. Moran, or Moran, or however that's pronounced. And uh, 
Meanwhile, down in the receiving room and visitors area at Arkham Sanitarium, uh, Saul Moran, the private detective, played by Ryan, is here waiting with Margot Macy, played by Lynn. And uh, you're in here with a receptionist and uh, one other person, a nervous-looking woman who's chewing on a fingernail over in a corner. And uh, you know you're here to pick up your good friend, Rachel, who's involved with you in your previous adventures. And, uh, and you're, just, you're just waiting. And uh, meanwhile, the lady who's in here nervous, nervously chewing on her finger, as it were, uh, certainly is uh, not unaware of your presence. And she's been listening to your conversation. You know, she can't really help it. And she approaches both of you. Oh, excuse me. Uh, could, I couldn't help but over here. Did you mention something about being a, a, a private detective, sir? Yeah, that's right. Uh, um, do you have a card or anything? Well, I suppose, uh, sure. Yeah, well, I can get you a business card here. Let me give me one out of my, uh, my jacket pocket here. Uh, oh, oh hey, I asked so- about a pack of camels here. I'm going light, to light one of these up. You want one? Yes, butt me, please. Will do. Yes, yes. And is this your wife? Uh, not yet. Oh, oh, congratulations. Are you engaged? She asked Margot. Well, we spend a lot of time together. Oh, I see. He's, well, he's, he's a damn fine dick, let me tell you. He's a damn fine dick. Highly recommend his services. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, of course, of course. Uh, uh, thank you for, for clarifying that. I, Well, you do look like a modern woman. And perhaps you... I, I might need your help. I, I don't know anyone in Arkham, you see. I've I've come here from a very, very long way away. San Francisco, in fact. Uh, my uncle, of course, is here. Uh, he's, he's actually my great-uncle, or my gronkle, as it were. Uh, perhaps perhaps you've heard of Christopher Van Horn? And you haven't. Uh, no, I don't think I have. Oh, well, you see, my, my cousins had him committed here after he changed his will. And, and uh, I, he's, he's been sending me very lucid letters, and I don't believe that he's insane. And, and I, I wonder if... Would you be willing to consider trying to prove that he's sane? Is that the kind of thing you do as a, as a dick? Uh, well, I think uh, that would be more in the uh, realm of... Uh you know, a uh, 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 well, head head doctor. What do, what do they call that? I don't, I don't know, but but one of them. Well, I think that's what they're doing here. But you see, he has strange beliefs. But I, uh, I, I believe him. You see, and, but just then uh, the door opens and Doctor Harcourt comes in, escorting your friend. Rachel Hemingway, and you three are reunited. Meanwhile, the mousy woman kind of retreats for the moment away to allow you your your time together. Uh, well, here's your here's your friends, Dr. Harcourt. Don't forget about your medicine if you begin to feel anxious, Rachel. Yes, I won't. Thank you for everything you've done, Doctor. Oh, yes, yes. Now, uh, I, must, I must get back to my other patients, and that woman tries to talk to him, and they're speaking in low tones as you guys get back together so medicine huh what uh what what they give you there oh it's some uh what did you say was opium or it's a it's a mix of ethanol and opium yeah ethanol opium mixture in case i get a little anxious is all well that well, sounds like some serious stuff there sure does. Well, I, well i'm sure i won't need it uh, if i'm feeling a little anxious Perhaps you can share. <laughs> I did take the liberty of bringing you well, uh, some clothes to change into. I see they uh, don't put a premium on fashion in this sanatorium here. So uh, I have a, a garment bag for. Well, I hope you didn't bring me any. friend Rachel. I don't wear. I, I, I won't wear any flapper clothes. You know, no, I'm not no, a flapper. No, conservative little pantsuit and a hat. That, that's exactly like what I like. Pants excellent, suit. excellent. I thought it <laughs> seemed to your taste. 
Well, just then the voices are raised over in the corner where the woman is uh, speaking with Dr. Harcourt. No, I've told you again and again, your uncle suffers from grievous delusions and he simply cannot be allowed uh, to, to leave at this time. I, I am afraid my, my clinical diagnosis is very clear. Your uncle is delusional, madam. And there will be an end to it. Good day. And he hey. begins to... Oh, Doc. I'm sorry. Hey, Doc. Yes? Uh, this, 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 uh, her uncle, are you talking about that, right? Yeah, that, that's, that's correct. Uh, would you mind if I talk to him a little bit? Oh, I don't know. That would be highly irregular. Isn't aren't uh, 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 patients allowed visitors? I mean, I well, didn't get any visitors, but <laughs> well, that's hardly the point. And I would, I, 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 I just don't know. It would take a great deal of convincing. I would have to see that there was some clear benefit to, uh, to the visit, especially in just more than idle curiosity. Hmm. Well, I'm not a you know I'm not a doctor like you or nothing, but uh, uh. You know, I mean, I, I think uh, at least to help put this this poor woman's mind at ease. You know, uh, if I talk to him and he sounds like he's, uh, you know, a wacko or something, then you know, I, I could I could maybe comfort this uh, this lady's, uh, you know, fears, concerns. Well, you understand, there's strict patient confidentiality rules in place, and uh, you would be barred from any sort of outside discussion. Well, it's not like I'm going to write a paper, an article about it. Well. It's exactly that sort of thing that I'm concerned about, Rachel. Yes, well, you know, I, uh, I am looking for the next scoop, but of course I respect, uh, I respect the confidentiality, of course. Yes, and also, you know, uh, uh, it is your, it is your cousin Roger, he says to the lady, who of course is, uh, this man's son, and if his son, uh, wishes him committed here, obviously, uh, we're him being so much closer than you who live in San Francisco. I just don't think that you have the uh, expertise to make any claims about uh, whether you believe his strange delusional stories. But as for your request, uh, Mr. Uh, Moran, I just I just don't know. Hmm. Now, does, do I, any of you have any skills you think might be helpful in this situation? Uh, such as persuade. I have a Decently high persuasion. I could make an attempt mm -hmm. to talk to this fella. Yeah, uh, well, he's going to have to be persuaded by one oh. of you. And you could perhaps persuade him with some money. I don't know if that would work. Mm. Yes, I could do him. that as my... Maybe. Might. But she, she's got a lot of money. alone. Well, I, heard, I thought I heard some dice... I thought I heard some dice clattering. Is there anybody out there who feels that they were particularly persuasive in this last exchange? I was not particularly persuasive. But I haven't whipped out the wallet well, yet, so... <laughs> haven't given well, him any clams yet. Perhaps he takes some clams for for persuasion. Well, how about, how about Saul? What'd you get? Uh, Saul, uh... It had a 45% chance, but he rolled a 72. Uh, so well, you might have to get them clams out. Would uh, fast talk work at all? In this it, it would like temporarily convince him it was a good idea, but he might change his mind in the next half hour to 45 minutes type of thing. Yeah. Persuade is to convince somebody of something for good. Fast talk is to yeah. convince somebody of it for now. It's Distract him in a, for a brief moment at least. Um, yeah kind of um why don't we try the clam angle <laughs> all right well, did you make a fast talk roll uh no i guess i should yeah. i'll try i mean it's possible he might be convinced that say you have might help reinforce you know uh your cure to uh, see someone else in their delusional state or whatever yes and i did roll 31 which uh wait well, let me make sure Yes. We'll check. Yeah, I, I have right. 55 in fast talk, so. Well, says Dr. Harcourt, I suppose that no great harm could come yes. of a very short interview. And uh, especially just because of your own delusions, you could perhaps help dissuade him of his. 
Yes, and uh, I think it would benefit uh, not just me, but uh, perhaps uh, if I did write an article about your expertise in diagnosing, uh, you know, insanity, um, it would you it would be very uh, helpful uh, to the public to see the the drastic difference between a healthy person and a, an insane person. Well, I. I I'll have to give that some some deeper thought, but unless I just change my mind about this very soon, I think a, a short interview will not hurt. And uh, he agrees to that, and uh, the woman, whose name is Fawn, by the way, says, Thank you, thank you so much. I I, I will await you here. I've, I've, I've visited with my uncle already, and I told him I would try to get some help. And, uh, I, I'll wait here for you. And uh, you're led down into a uh, long hallway. And uh, Dr. Harcourt unlocks a door. And of course, this is a hallway that you realize Rachel's just been in, you know, for the last year. But as you open it, or as the door is opened, and you hear the sounds of people kind of screaming and laughing in the background, and uh, the smell of bodies that really just get washed about once a week and things like that. It's not like a cruel and human place, but very institutional, you know. Like the smell of of, uh, of of unwashed bodies, but overlaid with the smell of cleaning chemicals and things like that, and it just doesn't seem like a pleasant place to be. The whole vibe in here is uh, suddenly somewhat otherworldly and uh, oppressive. And down at the end of the long hall, Doctor Harcourt uh, knocks on a door and says, "Doctor Van Horn, you have visitors." And opens the door. Goes, I'll just give you a short amount of time, and then I'll be back. And inside, you all three see a, a man in a straight jacket over in a corner, and there's like no furniture or anything in this room. Uh, but he says, come in, come in. I'm quite sane, I assure you. And uh, he's, a, he's a, an older man, you know, much closer to 70 than 60, and yet his hair is still... Uh, dark brown, you know. He seems in, in very good health. His skin is uh, very, very dark as if he spent many, many years outside and it's weathered against the sun. And uh, the door is, of course, closed behind you, leaving the three of you in here with the so-called Dr. Van Horn, of whom you know almost nothing, but can now probably find out. Uh, so, Doc, uh, yes. you got your... Uh like a uh, great niece, I think it is, out uh, in the in the lobby over there. Oh, is the poor dear still here? I tell you, my son will will never allow her to to release me. I, I wish she would go back to San Francisco. She is a dear. She's a very dear girl. So why you uh, why your kid got you locked up in here for? Well, I suppose I was not a very good father. Ultimately, uh. Or else this emotional rift would not have occurred. But you see, I have important work that must continue after my death. And therefore I changed my will to ensure that that work can continue to be done. And believe me, I left Roger and his family enough money that if he also perseveres as a man, then he has a nice nest egg to begin with and to rely on. But no, the vast amount of my fortune must go to my great work and not to my, my, uh, dewdropper, dewdropper of a, of a, of a son, unfortunately. He would like to live a life of leisure with my money and there's so much more important work that needs to be done. And I feel, despite the fact that I'm hale and healthy, that uh, my years will soon be ended and my great work must continue. Is more important than anything, he says. And then, when he, the way he says that, you almost wonder if he isn't a little bit crazy. Uh, my name is uh, Rachel Hemingway. I'm an re- independent reporter. Um, now, what did you say your work was? Oh, well, I'm afraid it wouldn't be of interest to the general public. It's highly esoteric, you see. I see. And, uh... Who did you, uh, you said you changed your will. It won't be going to your son. Who, who will inherit your, your, uh... Well, you seem, you seem like nice people, and you seem quite determined to know. 
And I have no qualms against speaking to a reporter, although I do not wish to uh, provide any hint of scandal or fear where it is unwarranted. But I am an archaeologist, and I spent many years excavating in Palestine and North Africa and other places reached by the ancient Phoenician peoples, you see. And I've discovered certain artifacts that I must continue to have collected. If I cannot do it myself, I will establish a trust that will ensure that for the next two or three generations, this important work can continue. Beautiful artifacts such as these, he says, uh, uh, and uh, he reaches like he's going to try to point to something, and then he realizes and remembers that he's in the straitjacket. Oh, if you will, please come over and inspect the necklace I wear under this collar. I will approach <laughs> Which, which one of you would Van like Horn. to approach him? I will approach him. Oh, yes. And inspect his yes. amulet. Ah, oh, you have lovely perfume. Oh, thank you I so much. I do not wish to offend. It's been many years since oh, I've been a, a in the presence lady of a young never, and beautiful woman. Never could be offended by such a, a chaste compliment. I very much appreciate it. Though Saul... Yes, now you see the medallion I wear. You just pulled it out. There's a good inch of give there. You may pull it out and show it. And uh, it's just a simple gold medallion. Uh very deep gold and there's just some strange symbols etched into it they don't make a lot of sense to you but it's, it's beautiful things like this you see the doctor allows it as a kindness since I am in the jacket anyway I cannot use it to do whatever nefarious things I might do the can doctor is a good man he treats me as well as he can can you tell us but this medallion can... reminds me you see I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt. I'm, I'm curious about these symbols and what they might mean. Well, they speak of an ancient religion. And it is this religion that I have spent my lifetime uncovering. It is a rather dark religion dedicated to cannibalism. And it is, yet it is not through any uh, perverse desires or interests on my part to pursue this. But I think it must be brought out to the light of day in the scholarly journals if cannibalistic religions were once widely practiced throughout uh, oh, lands lands ruled by both Sinai and Olympus as it were you know uh, cannibalism at the root of our culture is it, is it not present in disguise in the Christian religion as well with communion and eating the flesh of God why he's saying this Rachel is taking notes and saying, what a scoop! What a scoop! <laughs> At any rate, I am not insane, and I know this because I've seen them. I've collected several artifacts. One I have around my neck. The other I have in safekeeping in a bank deposit box. The other I displayed on my mantelpiece at home. Now, these artifacts are all artifacts that I think I can tie to this this ancient cannibalistic religion, you see. But some of my colleagues who I've worked with over the years in Palestine, I've learned through correspondence, have begun to come to tragic ends in strange ways. Is your interest in this me. ancient religion, is this purely academic? What is... Uh you you seem rather I don't want to use the word obsessed, but uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a, a you euphemism think I'm mad, don't for you? obsessed. But I, is is it purely academic? What what exactly are you are you trying to get to the truth of? I am trying to get to the truth of who we are as a people. You see. Also, if I could establish the presence of such a religion, I could establish that its existence had been suppressed, you see. All of Western history would be called into question. Is this my desire? No. But I am an academic, and I am a scholar and a scientist, and as such I value the truth most highly above all things. And I tell you, the reason I'm here, did they tell you why I'm here? Did they tell you what I did? No, they no. didn't mention that. Well, 
I began to realize that there were still servants of this ancient religion. And I believe they are trying to get these artifacts. I believe this is why my friends in Europe have died. And why my colleagues in North Africa have died. And I believe I am next. That is why I established the trust to cheat them. For you know, I have seen them. I've seen them looking in through my windows. And therefore I brandished a shotgun and I shot at them. Mm. And of course, my son, Roger, used this as a pretext to have me thrown in here so that he can have my fortune for himself and can be a lazy gadabout for his life. Did you happen to actually hit anyone that you shot at? Oh, I think I did, for I heard a great uh, cry of pain, and uh, as well as gibberings and meeping sounds. It was quite horrific, I assure you. Assault and, and murder are often frowned upon in society, so... <clears throat> perhaps I can see why the committal was necessary, at least for a brief time. Yes, but I, I assure you that uh, I am quite sane. And of course, uh, the artifact I speak of is still there at the home. My only fear is that uh, Roger will take up residence there early and bring himself into danger. But the warnings, of course, that I've been trying to give are going on deaf ears. Huh. Well, uh, I don't know. I, I, I mean, uh, we could go look, you know, get it, uh, recover it for you so that uh, they don't, you know, come kill your son. I don't know if that's what you're afraid of there. Well, he is my son, after all, even though he has had me thrown in here. But if you get it, you must find a way to uh, destroy it would be out of the question. But it should be put away in safety. Have any of you the means to rent a safety deposit box, perhaps? I cannot have it done in my name or Roger will find out. I know a dame that can do that. Not me. Yes, this is possible. This well, is possible. It would give me peace... It would, it would give an old skull a peace of mind, perhaps, if this, if this artifact could be retrieved and taken away uh, and put in a place of safety. And if you could return here and, and let me know that for sure, I would be very indebted to you. I could even possibly find employment for you in the trust that I set up. Surely open-minded people would be necessary if... Uh, things turn out the way I think they will. And I would not dare to think of evolving people without proper remuneration. Well, I see. Uh, I suppose uh, we could uh, go to your house uh, if you were kind enough to give the address and uh, we could uh, perhaps uh, look for this artifact. Uh, I um, don't know if your son is there or not, but... Um, We'll have to see. Yes, I don't know if you'll find him or not, but I must warn you, he's 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 very uptight individual and, and highly nervous. And uh anyway, the the uh artifact that you will be looking for is a beautiful piece of jade fashioned into the likeness of a cat. You cannot miss it. I loved to gaze upon it. Uh, now it is actually a container for if you were to lift the head of the cat. There's some, what I believe to be dried blood inside it. The blood of what, I don't know. I presume human blood. But that is the artifact that I believe they are after. It is one of the seven artifacts we recovered in Palestine. Three, of course, I have. And, of course, I am safe as long as I am in here. Of that, I am quite certain. But you would make, you would make an old man, you would put an old man's mind at ease to recover it. And certainly, if my, if, if my young fawn has, uh, referencing his need, has approached you, then you must be people that I can trust. And I can tell that this large bimbo here is a man who is accustomed to the ways of violence, if that should become necessary. Well, uh, I don't know. What do you broads think? Gotta go, go do this. Yes, I think we are to, uh, 
at least check it out. And if the son is there, we'll have to we'll interview him and if he uh, is willing and uh, and find out uh, his case. We don't want to just assume that this man isn't insane. He very well might be. I'm trying to say that so Where? he doesn't hear. But yeah. Where my hard-boiled bimbo goes, I will follow. Well, isn't that romantic? And you with two that, lovers. In fact, uh, with that, um, Doctor Harcourt begins to think better of the rash decision he's made in allowing a patient he's just, you know, allowed just just proclaimed cured to go right back into the asylum and talk to. Uh, he comes back in. I, I'm so sorry, Rachel. I've made a professional misjudgment. Allowing you to have this conversation could endanger all the work we've been doing. I, I must insist that you all leave and 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 leave uh, leave Doctor Van Horn to his therapy. That's quite all right. We we are just finishing up now, and we'll be on our way. And you've not made a mistake. You you've uh, you've been very helpful, and uh, we'll be on our way. The man is quite insane. You're right. Yes, oh, yes, we, yes. That we was my judgment the, as well. The opportunity to speak with him. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And, uh, anyway, back out in the in the uh, reception area, Fawn Van Horn comes up to you. Says, "Do do you believe me now? He's he's a very he's a strange man. He's eccentric, I know, but he's perfectly sane. Did you have a chance? What did you talk about? What will you help us?" I think we can uh, try to help, but uh, we'll we'll need some more time. We 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 are going to uh, his residence. Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> it's kind of hard to make a, a firm judgment either way uh, at the moment, but um, we're definitely interested in helping. Well, I, I respect your professionalism, and and um, well, I, I I I have a key to the place here that should make things easier for you. Uh, I, I'm afraid I, I won't go. I'd be too afraid to run into my cousin Roger. He's a real Mrs. Grundy, that one. I wouldn't want to give him the time of day. So so I, I entrust this key to your care, and if when you need to reach me, I'll be staying at Ma's boarding house. Very well. Whose boarding house was that? M- Ma's boarding house, oh, okay. as in someone's Ma. Gotcha. Yes, it's a prominent location on the Arkham Horror board game map. And uh, at any rate, I, I thank you, and I look forward to hearing from you. Yes, we'll be in touch, yes. Well, of course, by now evening is fallen, and uh, wouldn't you know it, there's a late October a late October storm blowing in, and you can hear the thunder in, uh, in the background, and you can tell that uh, it could rain soon, but right now there's just a cool wind blowing up. And the address that... Uh, We'll assume you were given for Christopher, Ever- Christopher, Doctor Christopher Van Horn's residence. Uh, is actually outside of Arkham. I, I didn't Saul Moran have a car. I don't remember, but we can s- certainly say I'm he did. Sure that. I yeah, ain't even I mean, sure he did. I uh, have recently like listened Margo to at the, the train, train station, and it, yeah, I yeah, he does have a yeah. car. So. All right. Well, it turns out this uh, this place is a sleeper jump from town. It's like uh, 40 minutes almost from Arkham, like up in the north. You go way out into this archaic New England, you know, forest. And there are winding roads, and you pass these small towns every now and then, you know, every 10, 15 minutes. But eventually, you're out to a place of... of where there's a fairly broad estate, but it is really overgrown, except for the grounds right around the house. And there's like a gravelly loop-type driveway that leads up into it. And uh, there is a light on in the house as you approach. And anything else, uh, you just have to make spot-hidden rolls as you pull in to see what there is to be seen. Perhaps, uh, I don't know if we should attempt to, uh, do some sort of distraction, uh, 
uh, come up with a, a premise. Uh, Rachel is, is probably very skilled at such things. Come up with a premise for talking to him. Uh, be seated in a in a sit- sitting room for somewhere somewhere, and I'm sure if he is any kind of gentleman, he'll offer us refreshments, tea, that sort of thing, and then perhaps uh, one of us can, you know meander off and uh, look for this jade cat. What do you think? Do you think of hmm. a ruse of, of that sort would be effective in this situation? Well, I suppose I could uh, say I'm here to interview him for some other purpose. And what is... We don't know enough about the man to to uh, come up with a reason uh, that I can think of. Well, uh, the uncle there uh, was saying he was a real Mrs. Mrs. Grundy, so uh, if that's the case, I mean, he's probably not going to be real happy that uh, we're here anyway. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Well, we, we got the key, right? So we could just, just go. go. We could just go in. Yes, he doesn't you know in the place. That's, that's true. true. Perhaps uh, doing the, the sneaky way would be better. And if he uh, confronts us and wants to use your your feminine wiles, you can dance and shimmy and uh, <laughs> shake your tail feather. That's at least uh, buy us some time in Wiz. Uh, well, did anyone make spot hidden rolls as they... Uh... I rolled a 99. I rolled a 77. Yeah. I rolled a 56, I I one which now. should get it done. Okay. Well, uh, as you approach, you do notice there's a. It looks like a. a, a gophers have, have messed up the yard around the, the house. And that's your first instinct because there's like little uh, piles and uh, chunks of turf kicked up and things like that. But then you realize there's actually just been a lot of, uh, like, some kind of animal movement out here outside of the house recently. Now, I don't know if any of you are skilled in tracking or anything like that. Uh, my, my guess is possibly no. Go for but, tracking. Uh, well, I mean, Go or any kind tracking. of uh, being able to identify what kind of tracks these things are. But we can just call it a knowledge roll when it boils right down to it to see what all of you think these things are. Or a no roll, as it were. I have a guess. Uh, well, I made a my no roll. Oh, well, and that's and that's what and that's what uh, it is is a guess in a situation like this with a no roll. I rolled out. I rolled right. an eight. Well, it sounds like every at least two of you have made it. So, it's quite clear, although it seems a little strange at first, that some of these these uh, prints really are what they are. But they're also like like kicked up. Uh, they're they're deep prints, and they're kicking up other bits of turf and grass and tearing up the the lawn you know there actually seem to be like cloven hoof like goat type foots every now and then and it's this sharp part of the cloven foot digging into and out of the earth as it's moving around out here that's like literally tearing up the place well there's a wild goat on the loose i suppose well that uh, explains why the uh, lawn is so well taken care of I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, cutting the grass. Yes, I've heard goats will just eat, eat about anything and just cause havoc to crops and lawns and everything. You know, one time I saw a freaking goat eat a tin can. No lie. Oh, yes. They're, they're one of the few animals I suppose I could probably do that. Well, as this conversation continues and you're getting up closer to the door, I assume or closer to the house in general, you see that uh, there's also a little bit of damage to the house. It looked like somebody's taking like a four-pronged garden, you know, hook and like scraped uh, the paint on the walls around the front door and some of the windows and things like that. Uh, and of course, one of the windows is broken, but that coincides with his story of how he shot at something through a window. And there's even broken glass outside of it and everything. Uh, the light that is on is on an upstairs room, by the way. The, the entire house isn't lit. 
but uh, anyway, those are more details that you see as you approach the house. And I'll let you just walk in or ring the bell or whatever you'd like to do. So, uh, what do you, what do you, uh, looks like somebody, uh, I bet somebody had, uh, you know, like a, some kind of gardening tool and was out here chasing the goat around and had an accident and scratched up the paint or something. That's weird. Yes, it's um, very strange. I agree. Now I say we go inside. Well, let's. We might be. This man might be armed. If we just walk inside and surprise him, he could very well just kill us all. I I suppose we ought to to uh, knock at least, and if he if he uh, refuses to let us in, um, well, he has no right and. Perhaps before we knock and take a direct approach, we should uh, see if we can see in any windows, see if there's any activity uh, down on the main floor, um, and if there's no one around, perhaps we should just use our key and, and go right in. Well, you think you the longer you hang around out here, the better chance there is that you know, so someone will, you know, notice what you're doing. But uh, like I said, there are no lights on the lower floor, and it is, of course, dark outside by now. But uh, uh, most of them, in fact, seem heavily curtained, except for that one where the, you know, you can look in that window, the broken window. Well, you and, know what? Uh, I'm a confident woman. I'm going to march right in. And I'm going to shout, Anima Control, there's a goat on the loose. Oh, well, there we go. That decides the matter for everybody, and that's, I appreciate the bold, decisive action. And you hear immediately footsteps running down from upstairs, right into this entry hall. And uh, footsteps come running down, and there's a tall, impossibly tall and thin uh, guy but uh, he, he looks a lot like his father. Um, but he himself is, you know, much older than you. I say, what's, what is all this? You don't look like animal control. I've never heard of such a thing. I demand an explanation for this immediately. Back yourself right out onto my porch before you come barging into my home. Now, who are you? And exactly what are you up to? I demand answers this instant. Uh, uh, state your name, please. I, I'm not giving my name to you. I should I state your name. Perhaps you, you should state your name. Do you have a deed for this house? That's that's not any of your concern. Now, I warn you, I took a first in boxing at Cambridge. And he adopts a pugilist's stance. And I, oh, I don't good. mind knocking at a woman either. Uh, look, look, Mac. Uh, you know, you've got a wild goat running around your yard eating up the grass, causing these uh, massive potholes and stuff. It's a hazard to the to the neighborhood, hazard to the environment. Um, you, you get you, you got to you got to you got to I'm going to have to write you a citation. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I very much would like to see some sort of identification from you or your two lady friends. The goat ate my registration. <laughs> <laughs> they eat everything, don't you know? I don't know what you're talking about wild goats preposterous well you ought to have a look on your front yard well it ain't his front yard he hasn't proven that he well, yeah. owns the place yet you're have a squatter have you seen aren't your you? front yard you either you act like you don't know what what we're talking about obviously animals have been rooting around the front yard for some reason I don't know but listen I'm not going to talk another instant I'm going to ring up the sheriff this moment you'll excuse me and uh, he walks uh, into the hall where there's like an old school phone with a little headset. Does anyone want to stop him or try to fast talk him into changing his mind? No, I'm just going to run up the stairs. <laughs> just ignore him and just run up the stairs. Hey, you! What? Hey, hey you! While, I'm going to find uh, that goat, goddammit! While Saul and, Hello? and perhaps uh, uh, f- Rachel go to find the goat i will oh oh no oh sir please don't call the sheriff uh, we can talk about this like reasonable people you're a very handsome and and obviously well-educated man who's 
just trying to protect his property and we're just some concerned citizens. You know how Arkham is. It's awfully frightening out here. And I managed to make my persuasion roll to keep his attention focused on me for the time being, at least. Well, listen, I'm not going to have ruffians from outside refusing to show identification, demanding to know my name and deeds to the house, and running through the place. Now, you upstairs, you come back down here this moment. Now, I realize you may or may not do that, but uh, I... uh, you've, you've at least stopped him from calling the police for a little bit, you know, is what you've succeeded in doing. And, Rachel, what were you doing after Saul ran upstairs? Um, I actually... Maybe I ought to just... I'm going to walk outside and, and try to find the uh, cord to the phone and cut it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you go back outside. Saul goes upstairs, and uh, Margot is with Roger Van Horn. And so we're in the classic split up in a horror movie. Okay. <laughs> now... As you go upstairs, Saul, to the, you know, background noise of Margot trying to convince Roger not to call the police. And, of course, at the top of the stairs, there's a landing, and there's a little hall, and uh, obviously there's a, a bathroom in here. And you see a master bedroom. Uh, the drawers are all opened, you know, and, like, stuff's been, like, torn out of them, and uh, the bed's... Uh, Looks like somebody's been looking under the mattress of the bed. You know, all kinds of signs of somebody being search. You know, searching for something up here. Um, and across from that is another room that might be thought of as a study. And it's uh, very crowded in here. Just floor to ceiling bookshelves on every single wall. And there's all kinds of books. And if you just a quick browsing of the titles. You know, if you were interested in things like archaeology and the Middle East, this would, you know, be a library of regional or almost national importance, perhaps. Uh, but uh, one book is sitting out on a little reading lectern that's open, as if somebody's been, uh, you know, reading it recently. Not in the last few minutes, because there's dust on things, but, you know, somebody's been reading it over the course of the last few months and studying it. And do uh, you want to? Inspect that book in more detail, Saul. I'm just looking for the cat. You don't see any cat. Not on any of the shelves. There are a few little knickknacks and things like that, but not not in here. Now, there are other wings on the house, you know, on either side of the entry hall down below. It could be downstairs somewhere, but uh, not in this Van study. Did say something about a mantle? I know I'm not with... with Mer- with with Saul at the moment, but uh, but hopefully Saul will recall that he said something about a mantle. So perhaps locating fireplaces. He might. And uh, the other thing in here that I did not mention yet is there's a desk as well. And uh, of course, there looks like there's all kinds of important papers that that might have some bearing on the situation in here. But you definitely satisfy yourself that there's no cat. A lot of the correspondence on the table seems to be from the Middle East and Europe. And if you take any time to scan it at all, you see uh, just the word dead or died. And if you take more time to read those letters, let me know. Uh, well, that but was I think clearly, that was, you know, his uh, his buddies in Europe uh, getting axed. Yeah, and if, if you took more time, you might be able to like, find details about how they died or things like that. But... Um, uh, I'll cut away from you for the moment and uh, and cut back to Margot at the bottom of the stairs as he hangs up, you know, the receiver on the phone. He goes, oh, well, oh, thank if you'll you. excuse me, I think a, a, a quick bit of, a quick jolt is what I need. And he stalks into uh, what might, uh, you know, basically a, a living room. And there's very nice art on the walls, a lot of landscapes depicting scenes in the Middle East. And uh, uh, there's uh, like Middle Eastern swords crossed on the walls, you know, the curvy Arabic looking swords and things like that. And there's a big liquor cabinet. And this guy moves around the room as if he's not 100% comfortable with her, knows where everything is. And he pours himself a drink from the liquor cabinet and slugs it back. Are you a gentleman, my friend? I suppose you might as well have one. 
I would love one. Thank you so much. Now, this is all. Now, who are these men you're with? Well, why are you here asking for deeds about my house? Let me just come come clean with you. We've we're interested in the occult. Uh, oh. Yes, you know the rumors about Arkham, and and we've uh, we've heard some things about your uncle, some studies that he's done. Uh, my uh, my bohunk Saul, he is a private investigator. We have mm, started to develop a bit of a romance over the years, and and Rachel is a a very well educated reporter who's one desire and one thing that she looks for in this world is truth and and that honestly sir we've heard some strange things and we are truth seekers that is why we are here well i'll tell you this it's only because of this stiff drink i've had that i've sat here and listened to this nonsense for this log you sound as bad as my father on with his stories. You know he thinks he's been cursed, yes? You know he thinks he's been cursed for uncovering some Phoenician artifacts, and he says I... he's been seen, seen jackal-headed men peering at him through the windows. You should see what he's done with the sitting room. It looks like a war zone in there. The man took... He's, he's a danger to himself and others, leaving all his money to this strange mythical society uh, dedicated to the study of the... Bastus and Anubis and all these other nonsensical names. I tell you, it's just not right. It's just not right. Now, I will admit that he... Mm, I found some of his interests rather disturbing, but I think at the heart of it, he is an academic. And truth is what he's ultimately fighting. Sometimes in the search for truth... You see behind the curtain at things that maybe shouldn't be seen, and it uh, affects your mind. It affects your ability to make decisions. And I think, in the case of your your uncle, that that it's my it's my father. What's happening? Because he, your father. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, I think that may be may be what's going on. But I think ultimately, what he is is a truth seeker. And, uh, but, but I can see how you have found some of his work, uh, disturbing. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's all a bunch of Tommy rot. I'll tell you that for nothing. And, and furthermore, young lady, let me tell you this. He, I have, I am 53 years old and I have been brought up my entire life and spent my entire adult life expecting this inheritance. And now, at the last moment, to be told that it's going to fund some arcane studies about jackal-headed men and ghouls and other such strange things, it's just, it just makes me sick is what it does. And obviously, my father is crazy. You should, you should go have a look at that sitting room. Come and look what he's done to the sitting room. You just come in here and look at what he's done to our sitting room. Okay. And, and just at right. that moment, Saul has, yes. having no idea... That this conversation has been taking place uh, is walking down the stairs and uh, like clapping his hands and says, "Well, there ain't no goat up there. I don't know where you're keeping it, but it ain't upstairs." I I don't know what goat you're talking about. I always talk of goats. Your name Saul? Is that is that your name? You big bimbo? Yeah, Saul the bimbo. Well, as a matter of fact, I don't have a deed to this house. If you must know, this is my father's house. So I wonder why you're walking in so familiarly with a key. But I'm going to cut away from you guys for a moment and go outside to Rachel, who was going to cut the phone line. Yeah. And as I said, it's dark outside. And uh, when you go out there, it takes a while to even figure out, you know, exactly where the phone line would be. And uh, it turns out... Uh, at the back of the house, you can see where it's snaking down and uh, running across the yard over to it. Or, you know, it's not running across the yard, but you can see where it goes down into the yard. Mm -hmm. And a lot of phone lines aren't buried except for nice estate houses like this and things like that. But over beyond the gate, you can actually see phone lines, you know, a uh, line of uh, almost looks like crucifixes marching off, you know, silhouetted against the sky in the distance of the power lines that keep uh, this 
far-flung area connected to the services of Arkham. And once you're back there in the dark, just for a moment, off in the over, you know, the overgrowth that uh, approaches the back of the house, you hear a scuffling, a <laughs> snorting sound for a moment. You're not sure what sounds a goat makes, but uh, do you want to investigate closer? Yeah, do I? Uh, I, I doubt I have my uh, handgun that I used to have. Um, but, uh... No, you don't have that. I will, um... Try to see if I can see what that, uh... What animal made that noise. Okay, well, you move slowly in the direction, I guess, of, uh... uh would, you, would, or would you like to be, you know, really stealthy about it? Or sneaky about it? Do you have the sneak skill? It defaults to 10% if you don't. I have a 45 in sneak, and I will wow. try to use that. All right. And I got a 38. Ooh, you're very sneakily. Get up to the edge of the overgrowth and peer in. But suddenly, make a sanity roll as you see the strange bestial face that stares back at you with, out of its yellow eyes. And it's I would say the face is kind of dog-like, but it's also kind of baboon-like, and you can't really even fully grasp it. Did you make that sanity roll? No. Well, then please take 1d6 sanity loss uh, from seeing this thing. And then it screams at you really, really loud. And uh, do you want to try to fight this thing, or do you want to run? Uh, Well, I can't fight it, so I'm going to run. Oh, you turn and run, and you run back towards the house. And just as uh, you guys are having that conversation inside earlier, uh, Rachel comes bursting back into the house, <laughs> out of breath. I assume it's, you close the door behind you. It's not a goat. It's something else. Well, what is what it? What are you talking about? I don't know. What, what do you say? It was like a baboon and a what? I said that the face looked kind of canine, but kind of like a baboon, but you didn't even get a look at like the whole body of the thing. You just looked in the bushes, a face was staring right back at you, it screamed, you ran, and it was kind of baboon-like, but also kind of dog-like. It's a monkey dog. <laughs> a monkey dog? Um, okay, monkey dog. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, odd right there. That's, uh, Rachel, <clears throat> might I make a suggestion without um... I'm not going back. I no, won't no, go no, back. No, 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 no. Oh, <laughs> Rachel, no. Of course not. Of course not. But perhaps one of those, uh, one of those opium pills would be in order oh, yes, just yes, to, yes. to bring the, yes, the anxiety must, uh... level down, relax a little bit. I think, especially, I, you know, we've all seen weird things together, and perhaps this is one of those moments where we need to do, we need to use the tools that we have. To stay calm and cool-headed. I'll take one, too, if you're going to have one. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what I thought, that's where I thought that was going. Do, uh, do you want to have a pill? Yeah, I think we all ought to. I think we ought to offer one to uh, Mr. What, what's it, Van Horn? Is that his Van name? Horn. Well, when you, offer, when you offer it to Roger Van Horn, this is insane monkey dogs. It's absolute bosh. And he stalks over to the front door and flings it open. And then you hear the scream again as you all get a good look at this thing. It's this loathsome humanoid creature with uh, hoof-like feet and sort of canine-ish features and these terrible claws. And it's like uh, it, it's grunting and breathing hard and it's all encrusted with mold and things like that. And it grabs at poor Roger and tacks him twice and the first time it hits him with one of his claws and does five points of damage and with its other attack in that same round with the other claw it misses Roger but I actually forgot it can also bite poor Roger and it reaches out with its great mouth and that's gonna hurt and that's gonna be well, that's going to be eight points of damage, and I'm afraid to say this, but uh, Roger is dead. The th- creature rips out Robert's, Roger's throat. He falls to the ground, and uh, 
Now the creature turns and screams at the top of its lungs at you, and it hasn't gotten in door. through the door yet. Shut the door. And, and to make everybody on and the And to door. make it worse, from outside, from outside, you hear echoing screams of more, more screams like that, more than one. And uh, do you guys want to shut the door as Margo is? <laughs> yeah. I am running yeah. for the door. Yeah. So. Well, I'm assuming you guys all rush to the door and slam it in this thing's face. But Saul, uh, you get there. I'm, I'm assuming Saul is probably the strongest. I don't want to be sexist about it. But he is a big, tough, private eye. Uh, and uh, what is your strength, Saul? Fifteen. Fifteen is pretty good. And uh, what I'm doing is cross-referencing your strength with the strength of this thing. Which, believe it or not, is a little bit less than yours. And you've got to try to hold this door closed and, you know, because uh, it, it, it uh, gets like a, an elbow in, you know what I mean, before you guys can uh, get in. You have a 65% chance of uh, slamming this door on the thing. I'll be slapping in its forepaw with my purse. <laughs> 57. Oh, nice. And, uh, yeah, it's a close thing, but you do slam the door. Now, you know there's a broken window in here. You don't know why things are going to smash through a window or whatever, but um, you're, you, momentarily you can take a breath. And now, however, you can hear more creatures outside. You can hear gruntings and mutterings and uh, things like that. Perhaps there's a piece of furniture we can drag over and put in front of that window. Well, there is a nice display armoire down here that, uh, of course, you haven't even been in that room yet where the window was broken. That was the sitting room that uh, Roger was going to take you to. He's like, let me show you what he's done to the sitting room. But uh, if you guys want to go in there, well, make sure. Yeah, go well, ahead, I was going to suggest dragging, uh, putting something uh, against the, the door, front door first, and then we can check out the other uh, the, well, one, it's the broken an, window. It's an entry hall, so I can definitely see some kind of credenza type piece of furniture with a nice vase and flowers on it and things like that. And uh, man, If you guys want to grab that and slide it over and put it in front of the door, I can totally see like the vase of flowers falling off you know, in your haste. Mm-hmm. And uh, block that uh, door before you go into the sitting room. Uh, that, I can totally see that. And yeah. In the sitting room itself, the there's a little bit of ambient light just just from uh, outside and now from the door opening in with the light from the entryway. Uh, but that this is the room where the window was broken, has been shot out. And uh, But there's also shotgun blasts like in the ceiling and in the walls and things like that. And uh, there's a fireplace in here as well. And indeed, sitting on the fireplace smugly gleaming face of a uh, of a cat figurine sitting serenely and it's made of a creamy jade it must be the artifact the ancient Phoenician artifact that uh, Dr. Van Horn spoke of mm-hmm. but also there's windows in here and crossing the windows like in the just out of the range of light you can just see shadows moving about in the yard maybe is, you'd have to like look out the window and try to count, but there's there's a small handful of these ghoulish things outside. All right, well, let's make our first order of business covering up that broken window if we've not already done so. The display on more I mentioned earlier, you can uh, push into place and block off that window. Excellent. Although, uh, any of them could just throw a rock through a window or something, but you definitely get that blocked off. Does anyone want to take the uh, the artifact itself? Let's wait before we touch that. Um, this is a very unfortunate thing that has happened to uh, our friend Dr. Van Horn's son. I realize he was a, a bit of an adversary, but I don't think getting ripped apart by a goat monkey dog uh, was a fitting end uh, just for being a bit of a tightwad, uptight kind of person. <laughs> mm. Stick in the mud, 
but I don't think we should go grabbing a cat statue full of blood that's associated with cannibalism without some discussion and thought about what consequences may occur. Perhaps some research would be in order. Uh, Saul, did you did you you found you were in a library or a a study of some sort? Perhaps we could yeah, there's a the three of us retire uh, to the study um, and uh, and look through some of this research. See if we can find more information. Uh, so yeah, yeah, there's some of a uh, library up there on the second floor, but you know I'm not uh, not too much of a reader. I mean I didn't uh, pay too much of attention to uh, any of that stuff, so I don't think there's I don't know if there's anything about this uh, cat here, but uh, so I'm just gonna pick it up. Well, you pick it up, and uh, there's a little bit of a jolt through your arm, like you can tell there's something special about it, but there is no obvious and huge effect. One thing I do want to do that I forgot to mention earlier, in all the excitement when you guys. Uh, where, when Roger opened the door and you know you saw that ghoulish thing um, not Rachel since she's already done this but Saul and uh, Margot need to make sanity tests for looking at that thing especially seeing it rip out Roger's throat right in front of you oh that's a thing okay. I'm rolled 24 so I did alright well if you did alright then there's no sanity loss but if you fail you lose 1d6 sanity Feeling a little bit on here. Six, fuck. Yeah, there you go. Hey, it's exploding sanity dice. Roll again. No, that's not true. <laughs> so that would be awful. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, it would. <laughs> yeah. A system where dice explode, but only negatively toward against the player. <laughs> Never in, you know, a real grim game. Mm. Anyway, though, speaking of grim, you're in a grim place right now because, uh, and if you do all go upstairs to look in the library, that's a great idea. You don't know why these things don't bash through windows, but so far they don't, but they are obviously outside. Does anyone want to look out the window before you go up there and see if you can get any more information? Uh, no, but I think what I, what, what I will do is uh, go up there and uh, try to shoot some of them from... Uh from like the an upper floor store window. That's a good idea. And okay. I would like to take a moment to remind Rachel that uh, when we picked her up from the sanatorium, we brought back the stuff that she had with her. Oh, my possessions. Yes, your possessions. So you should find your your camera and your gun and and the useful things that uh, well could come in handy in this situation. Oh, bless your heart, yes, I, I'm going to make sure I'm gripping this gun tight. Okay. And perhaps, uh, perhaps we should take some photos of, uh, I know it will be a little scary, but, but, uh, we need some proof that we did not kill Roger ourselves. We don't want to be accused of murder and locked up in, in a, sa- in a sanatorium again. Um, not that we were, but I'm sure you can speak to that, Rachel. Quite unpleasant experience, and uh, perhaps we can provide a little proof, a little documentation that uh, these goat creatures, whatever, exist, and that they are, in fact, uh, quite violent. Violent killing monkey dog goats. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um. If I do, in fact, have a camera, I will, uh... I mean, it's a 1920s... Yeah, I don't know, just, have. like, <laughs> taking a picture into a dark yard and expecting to get anything other than his shadow, you know. Um, it could be, like, a classic... It, in later years, your photo you take could be referenced on, like, paranormal shows, but there's always going to be that doubt, because it's kind of shadow. The <laughs> ghoul looking over his shoulder like Bigfoot. Ooh! You know, but, uh... Anyway, this, but I could totally see getting photographic evidence would help. Getting any evidence, physical evidence of any well, kind. Well, let's yeah. try to take a picture of uh, poor Roger because <laughs> he's got the, you know, the the claw and bite marks on him. That so yeah, him. he's right there. All over, he's bleeding all over the marble flagstones. You said something about a kitchen, and that triggered me. I don't. I have. 
bad memories about kitchens. Oh so. yes, we did have quite the experience in the uh, the kitchen in our last adventure. I won't step foot in there. All right. But, well, uh, if he's inside, at least we know the goat men can't destroy. I don't know what they are. Goat men, goat dog. The cloven hoofed the cloven goat dogs. Hoofed beats murderous beasts. Um, yes, perhaps we could find... Uh, I will look before I join Saul upstairs, if that is in fact where he's going next. Um, uh, perhaps look for a linen or a cover or something to uh, place over the, the poor chap's dead, bloody, mutilated body. Yeah, right behind the entrance hall is a dining area, which is... Maybe what prompted fears of a kitchen earlier, because beyond that you can tell is a kitchen. But uh, on the in the dining area, you know, there's like a display area where they have their china set out, but their drawers and stuff beneath it, and there's extra tablecloths under there, and you can throw one over his body like that. Uh, I think that would be the respectful thing to do in this situation. Yeah. And uh, anyway. And in terms of any plans you might make, anything that you can reasonably expect to be in a affluent home in the 1920s is probably in here somewhere, you know. Now so I there's, say there's we, that. We uh, go up to that upstairs room, and and I am a, a reader, so I will uh, look at uh, what might have been found and see if it can help us out in any ways. Okay, now, now Saul, you've got the, the, the cat. Do you uh, do you want to open it? Do you want to unscrew its head? And... Not right. I mean, I will eventually, but uh, that's I'm, not his priority at the moment. I didn't think it would be, but you know, curiosity, curiosity <laughs> killed the the dick sometimes. So, darling Saul, do be careful. I would hate to see anything happen. Yeah, don't worry about it, sweetheart. I I got to take care of. All well, right. You... Well, I trust you. You're. You, after all, are very strong and, and impressive. So you two lovebirds are not going to make Whoopi right now, are you? I, no, don't be. Don't That's, be that way. My I would not be. Don't be a dumb Dora. <laughs> well, there's I a bedroom just here, start right? Screwing each other on the couch. Who does that? There was well, a bedroom here. We're not me. swingers. What? I'm a, I'm completely asexual, so I wouldn't be into well, that. You know what, Rachel? That doesn't surprise me in the slightest. I'll assume this conversation is happening as you're walking upstairs to the study, <laughs> and there you all find yourselves in that room, crowded floor to ceiling with books. It's got the open reading lectern with that one book that was open that someone had been reading recently. It's got the desk with some papers scattered on it. There's all kinds of things here. You know, it's a Call of Cthulhu game, so you know there's the obligatory room full of documentary evidence. <laughs> Let's see what we have here. Well, uh, probably a handful of sanity checks, if I had to guess. Well, who knows? Depends on how closely you read things. Does anyone, like I said, uh, there's, there's two points of interest, really. Uh, aside from the fact that the library itself is extremely impressive, uh, obviously the book that's sitting open on the lectern and the desk itself, which is scattered with papers, uh, would be interesting wow. things to look at. And of course, you can hear occasional bangings and stuff downstairs too. Not like any, there's not any serious attempt being made to get into the house, but from all over that, any little noise you do hear, you know, in an old house, I'm sure completely magnified in your minds, you know there's more than one of these things just roaming around outside. You know, it's a nice little stroll to where your car is. You know, you're, not, you're, you're probably feeling a little concerned. Yes, I, I suspect maybe there are some sort of magic. Uh, there's rules of magic that is keep, that are keeping these beasts at bay, but the, it could be only a matter of time before they they find a way around that and come in and slaughter us all. So we must work quickly, I think, and not. I would like to use my library use, which is 75, to uh, study these documents. Well, I think that sounds like a good idea. And uh, you said documents specifically, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll assume perhaps the uh, 
the desk area is where you'd start and of course like I said it's cluttered with things all over it but now there's any number of things that papers that seem to have no bearing on the situation but you do find uh, the will that was mentioned that leaves uh, almost everything to the Palestinian Archaeological Trust and uh, this must be the you know the, the thing he was talking about and there's very little money actually left to Roger not that Roger needs it now and beyond that oh, there's uh, yeah there's a letter from somebody named Carter who's uh, uh, couldn't be Howard Carter well, I'm not sure who it was, but uh, it's, a, it's a letter that's this to Dr. Van Horn, and it says, uh, What I write in this letter may seem fantastic. You can almost hear his voice, you know. Uh, but I beg you, please heed my warnings. Over the last two days, two workers on the Palestine expedition have been slain. Their deaths were brutal, too awful to describe. It looked like some huge animal had got at them, rending them limb from limb. Even before I sent you the artifacts that we had uncovered so far, I had heard it said that a curse would fall upon any who disturbed the graves of the dead. Of course, I ignored this at first, but now I can no longer do so. Just as the natives predicted, the vengeance of the dog god has fallen upon us. I plan to walk out to the desert tonight, carrying the items that we have uncovered. I will leave them there on the cold sand to be covered once more by the winds. I pray it will be enough that I will be allowed to escape this damned place alive. I beg you, abandon the three items that I have already shipped to you, lest your life be put at risk. And again, sign. <laughs> your BFF, Carter. And I'm going to assume that uh, I just read that out loud. So yeah, in that voice. You, you, you had an incredibly gifted at mimicry. Uh... But then the book itself, if the rest of you guys are, are looking at the book, uh, it has the rather shocking title, Ghoul Cults of Bubastis. And it's it's written, it's hard to read because it's written in a very archaic form of English, but it describes the practices of this, uh, it's specifically talking about an Egyptian cult, but it talks about being spread across the Mediterranean by Phoenician traders and things like that, that worshipped actual flesh-eating beasts that they would uh, have that lived underneath their temples and it was a great honor to be eaten by the beasts when one died because you'd uh, you know, gain a sort of immortality that way uh, that's about as much as you can get with a quick skim you know the book you read it in any more detail you're gonna be risking sanity well uh, so Saul uh, was in the uh, other room I think getting ready to start trying to shoot at these things but then when he hears Rachel read out the name of the book he rushes over and says what are you talking about boob ass tits <laughs> well, uh, there we go. I'm completely asexual I don't know um, <laughs> no way is there any uh, de depictions of this is a long run for a joke <laughs> <laughs> he ran into it to fucking say that uh, well, um, not my interest. What are you talking about? I'm not going to be able to say Bubastis anymore. <laughs> well, thank you for ruining that Egyptian god for me. All right. Um, but but my, some of you might remember from those of you who are educated might remember, you know, Bubastis being associated with cats and things like that. So it definitely jives with the... Uh, there's also some letters on that desk, by the way, of other of specific deaths about other friends in Europe and things like that, and uh, reference to that appears that some of those people who died in Europe uh, were missing limbs or had been gnawed upon. Other reference to cannibalism, and uh, you 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 all feel like that's about the some extent of the information that can be gained, at least information of immediate benefit that can be gained from this room. Can we do a library use role specifically targeted at the Jade Cat? Not and in anything less than a few hours. Okay. Um, now, did these... Is there any depictions of... I don't, I don't remember you said if there's any depictions of these gals so we know what we're seeing... 
like well, in, that, the, in the that is perhaps something you could find by flipping through that book and indeed you do find a rather crude depiction um, you know and it's like a almost medievally looking drawing you know, copied from a tapestry it is noted copied from a french tapestry but yeah the thing's kind of hunched over it has an elongated face goat like legs it's definitely a lot like the things you've seen outside and they're referred to as ghouls throughout the book and they even darkly hint that uh, humans can actually become ghouls through corrupt practices, specifically cannibalism. I was wondering that metagamingly, of course. I've watched Supernatural. Hmm. Well, <laughs> I think the, the showrunners of Supernatural have certainly read their H.P. Lovecraft. Yes, definitely. Yes. But that's, that's the information you get. You feel quite certain now that these things that are outside are, for whatever reason, the ghouls spoken of. These, these flesh-eating things that were once worshipped across the uh, Mediterranean world and the Middle East that somehow Dr. Van Horn and his colleagues have stumbled their way into and are now slowly stumbling their way out of. But clearly Dr. Carter's stories are accurate as far as you can ascertain because you've seen it with your own eyes. Well, uh, what do you say there, Rachel? Uh, you want to try to take some pot shots at these things and try to clear a path back to my car? Yes, I see. Uh, we can see how these uh, gunshots affect these ghouls, as they say. All right. Well, a good vantage point of the front yard could be got from the ransacked master bedroom. And although you'll probably never know, you remember it looked like somebody had been looking for something in here specific, but... Uh, Roger probably was looking for something, but that secret will, will die with him. It could be uh, very mundane. It could be related to the will or could something we like that. Do a search spot well, hidden. You could do that while the others are taking pot shots out the window if they wish. My point is, from this room, you get a good vantage point of the front yard, and you can see that great horseshoe shaped gravel driveway, you know. Uh, and, but it's still, it's, that's still about, you know, I'd say 20 yards from the house. But uh, there's a good moon tonight, and you can see the shapes lurking around the yard, hunched over be steel. And there looks I like shall do a spot hitting while they take pot shots out the window, because I am not armed. Okay. Well, if you want to do that, and of course uh, we'll get to the shots in a minute. <coughs> but but uh, how'd your spot hidden search go? Not well. I rolled an 89. I needed a 64. Well, I guess you'll never know what what Roger might have been looking for in here. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you know that with a handgun at this range and in this darkness and everything, it's going to be a crapshoot, uh, whether it hit anything or not. But taking the time to aim and not being in the midst of combat, I think we can safely say that any negative modifiers could be overcome by the fact that you can carefully just sit here in the window, at least for a round or two you know, to get some clean shots at these things. So, uh, because you're aiming and taking time, we'll not worry about the penalties for distance and darkness and stuff like that. Anyone who would like to shoot. And uh, will you be trying to both hit the same creature or shooting at different ones? And I assume, by the way, the window opens. <laughs> it's got to come open for that. And uh, it's an old school window. It's like hinged, you know what I mean? So it opens outward instead of sliding up. And you get a nice big view of the front yard. That cool air blows in to the room. and uh, Which is good, because it was an old man's bedroom. And it's kind of gross. And uh, You could take shots if you wish. You know, the second you do, they'll all be, you know, those things down there will know what's happening. But you could do a lot of damage with some well-timed shots. Well, I made mine by one point. Barely made it. Uh, just to shoot whatever is closest. All right, well, I, uh, Ryan, are you going to be shooting at the same closest creature? I am. All right, probably a good idea, you know, to concentrate your fire like that. Uh, were you successful in your shots, Saul? I rolled a six. Well, certainly you are. And both of your uh, bullets plug into this one that was closest. Now, uh, in fact, it was sniffing right around the, the front porch closest to the door. And... Your shots ring out in the night. You see a flurry of shadowy movement across the yard from the others. But both of you, please roll your damage. 
Except because of the rubbery skin, after you roll your damage, please cut it in half and round up, and then tell me how much damage you get. Because you do half damage, round it up. Five. I'm sure that's very disappointing, but the ghoul is very happy about it. Four. All right. So you've done a total of nine points of damage to the thing, and you can almost see, you know, the, the rubbery hide... Uh, impacting the bullets a little bit and uh, taking a little bit of the sting out of them. Yet the thing still cries out and begins uh, hammering at the front door in a rage now. Uh, you don't know how intelligent it is. It's certainly not trying to get away, but the others look like they're come charging across the yard with an insanely fast run. And behind them, they're tearing up chunks of turf. And you can get another shot in before these things they look like they're heading right for the wall like they might just try to climb right up and jump in the window at you uh, i have a absolutely ghoulish idea i think because we're going to run out of bullets before we kill all these things we if we want to distract them to run to the car i think we need a, to give them a body and i think we know we have a body downstairs. We'll, we'll, we'll go down there. We'll grab poor Roger. We'll, we'll tr- drag him upstairs. And we'll toss him out the body. They'll, they'll go to it. But that is a very ghoulish idea. I hope it doesn't land us all in the sanatorium because I think we murdered this poor man. There will well, be nothing left. left of him. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, we'll be alive anyway. They'll, they'll, well, they'll, that's a good argument. Uh, I I'm inter- in, in favor of being alive. I will interrupt. I think that also sounds like a good plan. I will interrupt long enough to say, in terms of evidence, um, that uh, Saul, your practiced eye tells you you guys did a lot of damage to that thing that's trying to desperately claw its way in through the front door. Now, you 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 estimate maybe if you can, you guys can both hit it again. You might be able to take it down and possibly have some kind of physical proof or actual body of one of these creatures. That's merely a suggestion, because these, yep. these, these uh, ghouls are rapidly approaching as we converse. Or are they are they kind of going to be like clustered up around the area of the front door? And more like under the window is where they're rushing. Because we shot from upstairs. So that might have been a good thing to get them away from the front door for whatever the next step in our plan might be. Our ultimate goal is getting to the car, I believe. Yeah, and you can just imagine them swarming towards the the window and, and, and swarming towards the wall and climbing up the, the wall and rushing in the window, or, you know, because they can see you guys up there shooting at them. That looks like what they're all going to do if they get to do it. Okay. Um, my, my concern was that if we killed the one at the front door, that they might try to eat it. Oh, but right, right, right. Well, there's probably... They probably, uh, they look a lot more intent in the moment at you. No, right, well, I'm going to take another shot at this fucking thing, man. Uh, what about, uh, what about you, Rachel? Are you getting scared as you see these things getting closer and closer? You realize to your horror, too, that there's a trellis with vines under this window. It'd be so easy to climb up. Um, I will shoot at another one. You shoot a different one? No. Uh, I'm going to... I'm going to shoot at the same one, I guess, yeah. All right. Well, and uh, luckily for you guys, time has seemed to go by so slowly as they charge towards the window, and you get two more shots off. Hope maybe you can put down this ghoul at the door. Well, be a 12, and ooh, six damage. Okay, which I assume has already been cut in half. Yep. And how about you, Rachel? I missed. Well, you missed, but guess what? With uh, Saul's shot rang true and it hit home and the thing's head snaps back and it collapses at the doorway. And you could tell that the onrush of ghouls notice it, but they don't rush over like sharks would, you know, to immediately eat it. Perhaps they crave more fresh human flesh. But they are now at the base of the wall ahead of you and are going are beginning to try to swarm up. And I'll tell you, you realize too, there's not like, uh, this is not like a huge horde out there. You've had enough presence of mind to realize there are, well, there's 14 of them left. There were 15 of these things. 
and there are 14 at the base of the wall. One of them managed to climb up. Obviously, you're going to get a chance to shut the window or run away first, but two of them managed to climb up. Three of them managed to climb up. Four of them managed to climb up. You realize they're very gifted climbers. They have an 85% chance of climbing up, and so what do you guys want to do? Rachel's plan of using poor Roger's body as bait is sounding better and better. Well, even if you don't have a chance to drop it out the window, it's still a good plan. Well, we'll just leave the front door open. And uh, so my plan, well, and I'm just... The, the Run for the door. front door? Yeah, I don't have time to, to articulate it. So I'm just going to slam the window shut and run for the door. Well... Yeah, that sounds like what someone would do. <laughs> I am right on his heels. Yeah, yeah, what about you, Rachel? Yeah, well, I assume so. Now, you guys are charging down the steps, I assume. Um, Jumping down the steps. Yeah, and um, I'm going to assume maybe you... I don't know if you took any of those papers or things like that with you or the book or whatever to... Uh, but but uh, did you? Um, yeah, I think Rachel would have. I think she might have. Okay. All right, and uh, you've got that stuff, and you get you rush down the stairs, and you're passing the dining room where uh, the body. I f- no, you just got the thing out of the dining room, the tablecloth. But when you get down into the foyer, there's the lump underneath the tablecloth that used to be Roger, and of course, blood all over the slick blood all over the floor. You know, right on the other side of the front door is that dead ghoul. Um, you don't you don't hear glass breaking upstairs for whatever weird reason it's like something about glass you know repels these creatures you're not sure if you if you're onto something or why they want to smash the windows it seems like it would be so easy for them but they don't do it now how long they'll be distracted out there at the window though is another thing entirely and of course the longer you talk about it the more time they have well and i'm not even talking as soon as i hit the bottom of the stairs i'm gonna run for the front door <coughs> and kick it open and um darling you do do you have the the cat have I you do. S- okay yeah, yeah still got the cat. i thought you did but i just wanted to confirm okay well you kick the door open and what and of course you can hear the screams and cries and this is they're not like around the corner from you either you know what i mean they're they're just like right outside to your left they're clustered around the bottom of the windows some half of them are still up the wall around the window. A few more are still on the ground. They haven't noticed you yet. How big are they? They're man sized. They're a little bigger, but they they're hunched over. You know, so they seem a little shorter. But if they were straightened out, they'd probably, be, you know. Yeah. So like, so basically, the odds of me being able to just quickly snatch this dead man out of one is pretty slim. I would have to think. I don't know. I think it might be. I think it might be uh, your only shot. Well, I'm going to try. I mean, I'm running, you know, I'm following him running out, so, and I also want to get one of these dead ghouls, so if I can catch up, I will try to help carry right. this. Yeah, and in terms of odds, you think uh, the odds of getting to the car are probably just about as good as your odds of pulling up and fighting over the next 12 to 24 hours, you know. Because um, you get this feeling as long as you can keep uh, the windows closed and, you know, no exits and entrances into the place that you could be here almost indefinitely with them around outside, but there'd probably be more and more and more of them. He spoke of seeing a few outside. Now there's like 15. And, 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 and Rachel now begins to put two and two together. There's long been rumors in Arkham about ghoulish creatures seen under the streets and sewers and things like that. They could be all of them. Who knows? But they, they're, what they're probably after is the artifact, like you thought, which you now have with you. But it sounds to me like you guys are pretty committed to picking up that body and running, and Rachel said that that she would help, and uh, when you kick that door open and you pick up the body and start moving, the ones at the base of the, of the wall cry out and turn around and and they see you, but there's a good distance. Again, it's a big house. And uh, now, Margo, I assume you're running with them. I am running as fast as my little flappy legs can carry me. You know, I'm going to shout like, um, Margo, 
get the car open, get the car started and open the door. Yes, 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 that's what I will do. I will scramble to the car and open the doors. Okay, well, Margo, make a luck roll to see if you can do that without, Oof. you know, because this is a classic, it's a horror movie and someone's running and they got to put keys into something. That never works smoothly. You know, like, <laughs> you know the hands on shaking with the keys and dropping them. So then they, you kick them with your foot under the car. Right, right. So that's how you're probably running out with the keys. And um, oh. um, and uh, meanwhile, Saul and uh, and Rachel oh, are. That's my ten. Never mind. I made it. I got a nineteen. Then, as Saul and Rachel struggle with the body of this ghoul. Um, they are heartened and heart- their hearts are warmed when they hear the car actually starting because four of the ghouls that were still at the base of the wall, you know, they haven't climbed down yet. All their heads have turned and uh, uh, they're beginning to run your way just about the time you throw the body, presumably like in the, in the back seat or whatever, of uh, this other ghoul. Do um, you guys want to turn and shoot them before you jump into the car? Uh, I don't think we have time. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to dive in all right put the pedal to the metal baby get behind this glass and it's quite smart because if you recall they they move a lot faster than you do you know across and as you put the pedal to the metal uh again i mentioned earlier on your way in how the the road up here was kind of windy and things like that and i imagine that, that you're probably driving quickly margo and so, as you guys turn around, you look in the, you know, out the window behind you. These things are really starting to pick up speed. You're not so sure they can't run maybe almost as fast as this as this car. So, please, um, make a drive auto roll, Margo. And if you don't have that, uh, if you don't have that skill, it defaults to 20% chance. I see that. Let's see if I can get another 19 or less. Wow. Yes, I got a nine percent. Oh, that's pretty good. My percentiles are rolling. Way good for me tonight. I'm sure, it's with a great sense of relief that uh, you all, those of you who are looking behind you, see the, uh, you know, in your tail lights, you can see the the eyeballs of these things getting smaller and smaller, and you lurch around and drift out onto the main road and begin heading back towards Arkham, leaving these things. They can maintain a very high speed for short bursts, but not chase you at car speed all the way back to Arkham. But you do know now they can probably sense this artifact. And uh, where do you guys go? You've definitely escaped, though, from the house. Congratulations. And you've got the body of a ghoul. And we've got the uh, jade cat, right? Mm-hmm. Well, do we want to uh, just pull over somewhere safe and uh, perhaps uh, look at that uh, cat in more detail? Yes, perhaps get to a very well-lit populated area where we can perhaps... A speakeasy would be go to a juice joint. Now's not the time to get your drink on. I'm not sure about that. Well, the Club Noir should be open. I mean, I know you guys have been there before. But uh, do you want to carry a dead ghoul into the the Club Noir? Well, no, no, obviously we don't want to do that. You're going to leave it in the car? (laughs) Leave the ghoul in the car and go to drink? Or we could just nope. sit here Why and don't you talk just... in the car for a moment. <laughs> Why don't you take one of, one of my pills here? Calm me down. I, I think that's a lovely idea. Yeah, I forgot you guys already took all those pills earlier. They probably should have had some game effect, but well, the fact that you weren't more freaked out than you were is how we explain that. I guess, but I thought that we, uh, right when we were talking about doing it, uh, I think the door, or he burst he opened the door, Roger, and then that yeah, he got but, killed. So. Yeah, but I have a feeling he probably took him anyway. There's always time to swallow a pill. There's <laughs> yeah. always enough time for pills. <laughs> Kids. So, no, and in fact, you know, really, what have you got? You've got, a, you've got this artifact. You've re- he said something about having put, putting it in a safe deposit box or whatever, but you don't well, know. Uh, you know, these things, as long as this thing is around, you the guy in the letter said he took him out to the desert, you know, to uh, 
get rid of them, but... I know what I want to do. I'm going to go straight to the Arkham Gazette. Because we have got a scoop. What do you think, Saul? Well, uh, we got a long drive uh, back to town here, so... Yeah, about 40 uh, minutes, yeah. So while Margo's, uh, you know, driving, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna examine this cat. Take a unscrew the head. Yeah. Do be do take precautions, darling. I, I don't think this cat is. I don't think anything good is gonna come from a blood-filled cannibal cat Egyptian thing. Well, as you, with fair warning, as you drive on, uh, Saul, so you take out the cat and you, you want to unscrew its head and examine the so-called blood inside. It would have to be like dried blood if it was really old, but yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, you uh, you open the lid, and uh, so it's like kind of some 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 dust or mist kind of puffs out, and you kind of. <coughs> 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 Just for a second, you know, uh, makes you sneeze. Oh, and uh, other than that, there seems to be no immediate ill effect. And uh, the next uh, forty minutes pass without incident as you guys get back to Arkham. And uh, Margot, do you agree to pull up in front of the Arkham Gazette? It's a relatively small town yes. paper, but there's always uh, somebody here. Yes, I think uh, I. I'm not convinced that turning the stuff over to Dr. Van Horn, I mean, we might eventually do that, but I think, uh, you know, covering one's ass, coming clean to the public and having something on record before we get involved in something that could potentially be very deadly and have dire consequences that, uh, that yes, I I agree with Rachel that this should be this should be documented. This should be shared. We should have as much backup as possible before we make any further decisions of what to do with this obviously dangerous and nefarious items that we have. That's right, and and this will surely get me a job again. Though. They'll know I wasn't crazy, and they'll hire me back, and I'll be the star reporter. Yes, that too, of course. That's Well, as you guys pull up in front of the Arkham Gazette, and I can see this little montage of uh, you running out and running in, and a couple people following you back out and opening the, the door and looking in, another one running in and grabbing a camera, and suddenly there's a small crowd of people all gathered around, and uh, you're all being interviewed and talked to. Of course, it's still the middle of the night, so people are being called at home, you know. Editors are being called at home to come in and photograph this thing. Uh, you know, there's probably, the sheriff probably arrives at some point to look at this thing. And all the while, all Saul can think about is he's sitting there during all this activity and looks over at Margot and he looks at her, her, her thigh or then her calf or a meaty part of, uh, of uh the, the, her shoulder blades. It's just you look at her and you think about how how hungry you are, and how you just love to take a nice bite. And, and I think that's a good place for us to just wrap up this Halloween special. And any 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 uh any unresolved uh, issues, we'll just have to pick up uh, next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a good good horror ending. I think. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. And so. <laughs> Uh, thank you for listening to our horror episode and thank you to Lunicorn Lynn for joining us once again you are very welcome thank you for having me it was a pleasure as always okay that's it for tonight Hope, be careful when you go outside trick or treating that there are not ghouls in the night wah <laughs> 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 <laughs>